so many people in different parts of the world have said to me, I don't like criticizing your country. We really have always wanted to be like America, to be like you in terms of what you stand for, in terms of the freedom, in terms of the equality that we see in your society. And when you don't practice it yourselves, you let us down. It's here. It's finally here. You've waited all year long. You've heard the hype. You've prepared your snacks. You're on the couch. And now, at long last, the moment has arrived. It's United Nations General Assembly Week. OK, it's not the Super Bowl. But dignitaries and diplomats from around the world will soon convene in East Midtown for what's been dubbed the world's most important meeting. So how much does this annual summit matter? Should you care? Hi, I'm Ian Bremmer in downtown Manhattan, where the traffic's much better, and so is the food. And welcome to your G Zero world. On the show this week, I discuss the geopolitical implications of the Me Too movement with Georgetown University's Milan Vervier. And on Puppet Regime, we go full game show. Grab your buzzers. But first, a word from the folks who help us keep the lights on. The United Nations has such great potential, but right now, it is just a club for people to get together, talk, and have a good time. So sad. That was actually a tweet authored by President-elect Donald Trump on December 26th, 2016. And let's be honest, he had a point. More than a quarter century from the Cold War's end, the veto-wielding members are still working hard to ensure their rivals can't use the UN Security Council to accomplish much of anything. In fact, since 1946, more than 200 resolutions have been vetoed by at least one permanent member. Moscow has 107 kills, Washington has 79, London has 29. Washington and London, put them together, has even more than Moscow, but you get the sense. As some of the resolutions that survived the veto still fell far short of the mark, like the resolution to stop violence in Rwanda and Bosnia during the 1990s and in Darfur in 2006. So in today's G Zero world, where risk-taking leadership remains in short supply, what good is the United Nations? This is a good week to pose that question, because dignitaries and diplomats from around the globe are descending right here on New York City for the United Nations General Assembly. Insiders call it UNGA. The General Assembly is still good for oratory and occasional bits of drama. This week, President Trump is expected to unveil his long-awaited Middle East peace plan from the UN podium. He'll also be presiding at the UN Security Council, a rotating role that falls to the United States this month. Trump will grab this opportunity to warn about Iran and the no good it's up to across the Middle East. Then Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, will take the stage for some finger pointing of his own. The speeches will conclude, the applause will be polite, and not much will change. In other words, Trump's tweet makes some sense. But that's not the whole story. Beyond the headlines and the hand-waving, agencies of the United Nations are filling a crucial need in the G Zero world. They're going to places and taking on jobs that the great powers want no part of. They're helping real people. They're investing in the future, and they're doing it on a very big scale. Peacekeeping operations in Africa, South Asia, the Balkans, and elsewhere limit conflict in hard-to-govern places that Security Council members want no part of. The UN Refugee Agency helps millions of refugees. The World Bank provides grants, credits, and low-interest loans to help poorer countries build the roads, ports, bridges, schools, and hospitals they badly need. The World Food Program, funded entirely by donations, has distributed 12.6 billion rations, that's billion with a B, to feed 80 million people in 80 countries. The World Health Organization is at the front line of health crises, but it's contributed to dramatic reductions in infant mortality, the deaths of mothers during childbirth, and death rates from HIV and malaria. UNICEF, the UN Children's Emergency Fund, treated three million malnourished children last year. It provides access to safe water, education, vaccines, and mental health care for millions of kids. The bottom line is that in a world where so many countries are building walls, 
where shrewd politicians offer an our country first approach to the world, who else is going to do all these things? Earlier this year, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres wrote a letter to warn member states that the UN now faces an unprecedented financial shortfall. Budget cuts are coming, he wrote, unless member states step up. Why is this happening? Too many member states, including some big ones, are late with their dues. Whatever governments of the wealthiest members think about UN values, they should recognize value in an institution that's willing to help manage conflict in the world's most dangerous places. They house and feed so many refugees, they ease so much misery, and they invest in safer and a more prosperous world. And now to office hours, where I take questions about all things geopolitics from real people, people just like you. Recently, my producers went out to Madison Square Park in New York City, that's like right there, to find out what people out there want to know about geopolitics today. Hi, I'm Naveed. Um, I'm just wondering, what is the scariest thing in geopolitics today referring to human rights? Hi, Naveed, and thanks for that. For me, I guess the scariest thing is the combination of advanced technology and Chinese authoritarianism. If I think about the fact that today China is truly a technology superpower. And in fact, they're leading the world in things like big data, because the citizens have no presumption of privacy, and voice and facial recognition. It means that if you're a Chinese citizen and you're even thinking about protesting, the danger to you and to your family, because the Chinese government has all that surveillance capacity, is greater than it's ever been in history. For the last several decades, there was a belief that as China got wealthier, they would need to become politically more like us or they'd fall apart. The people would revolt. Today, that looks like a dream. Um, and I think that the combination of technology and the Chinese government system is really concerning for the advancing of human rights in the world today. What's our administration's latest stance on Putin's involvement in the conflict in the Ukraine? Mariana, uh, the U.S. administration's stance is divided. Uh, on the one hand, President Trump himself has on record said that Crimea was Obama's fault. What's he supposed to do about it? Ukraine is corrupt. Why should NATO, America, and its allies support them? But the Trump administration, the State Department, the Defense Department, even the National Security Council, has been very interested in putting pressure on the Russian government more sanctions, including directly on oligarchs that are close to President Putin himself, to try to back them away from what has become a frozen conflict in Ukraine, including Russian informal troops on the ground occupying a big piece of Southeast Ukraine's territory. Trying to understand why there's a difference between the two has been one of the hardest things to figure out in foreign policy in the Trump administration. This week, I sit down with Milan Virvir, executive director of the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security at Georgetown University. She was also the first U.S. ambassador at large for global women's issues. Today, I'll ask her about the Me Too movement and the impact of women on foreign policy today. Let's get to it. Ambassador Milan Verveer, thank you very much for joining me. Oh, Ian, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. We have a world run mostly by guys. Uh, how would it be better if that weren't the case? I think it would be better in many ways, not that women are better than men or men are better than women, but we would be tapping the experiences, the talents, the perspectives of all of our people. Diversity is a plus. Diversity is an advantage. What we know today is that as women are included uh, in the economies of our countries, those economies are far more competitive and prosperous. Uh, they're jobs creating, their GDP growing, they're, in, they're enhancing inclusive prosperity. Where women are engaged in politics, they bring a different dynamism uh, to the political discourse and to political outcomes. In our own country, we have so few women in our Congress comparatively in terms of percentages. But if you look back at some of the achievements that matter uh, for uh, for for us as a country to benefit, women, families, et cetera. Women have come across their party divides, whether it's been Title IX, which has given all those young female Olympians, had a lot to do with their medals, uh, whether it's having a strong violence against women law, whether it's some of the uh, decisions that have been made in terms of health coverage, it has made a difference. 
Uh, and so I think we have to reach the point where we understand that progress for women is progress for society. It's a benefit to all of us. Yes, it's the moral thing to do. Uh, gender equality is the right thing to do. But it is the smart thing to do as well. Who are the next leaders, women leaders in the world that we're gonna pay attention to? I mean, today, you look at Christine Lagarde, you look at Angela Merkel. It's not a large group, right, of women that are really among the leaders of the free world. Who, who do you think in five and 10 years time, some people you'd point to and say, Ian, I think you should watch them. Well, you know, I don't have um, ready names, uh, but certainly there is women's leadership that is manifesting itself today. Uh, you look at the, the president of Estonia, who, who was very uh, impressive. Uh, she's young. PhD physicist by training, she, I think, right? She's very impressive. Uh, yeah. A mayor was just elected in Tunis, Tunisia, a female of all places. Tunisia is not in the best of situations economically, politically. Well, politically the it most be the democratic. It may be the only Arab Spring right. uh, country that makes it, and mm -hmm. we hope they do, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but she's somebody to watch because she is from the Anada Party, and and so she has to traverse the the social divide in Tunisia. But if she succeeds and presents that new model of female leadership, I think it will make uh, it will make for a very good uh, situation there. I mean, that is a country uh, where there was an attempt when they were rewriting the constitution after their revolution. Yeah. Um, to take women's equality out of the Constitution. It became a huge issue. It was gonna turn into women's complementarity. Uh, and it didn't happen because there was such a strong ferment out of the larger society, even though there was tremendous pushback. Yeah, separate from but equal some quarters. didn't work very well no, in the United States. No, it didn't States. work very well, yeah. for us or for anybody. So, I wanna ask you about the Saudis, because here's one where on the one hand, there seems to be a real commitment to making life different for women that have been truly treated as second-class citizens. On the other hand, very controversial and maybe some backsliding. We see a lot of women activists that have recently been detained uh, without perhaps a lot of uh, due process. Where, where do you see the Saudis right now? Well, I know that uh MBS. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown has, prince. Uh, the crown prince has conveyed the fact that he really, really wants to bring that society uh, into the 21st century. Uh, whether the pact between the ruling parties and the Wahhabis actually can be torn apart so that that can happen, I think remains to be seen. There are some things that are happening there, however, under his uh, leadership that are very troubling. You alluded to them. Um, you know, women who were the pioneers, many of them, in pushing for women's right to drive, which seems, you know, not like the biggest deal in the world, yet to emancipate them in that way, are in prison. Samar Badawi is in prison be because she has been uh, a strong advocate for women's rights. Other women are also there. Uh, the contretemps with Canada is inexplicable to me. You know, why uh, he would be so taken aback in the ways that he has been in responding to a tweet from the foreign minister of Canada uh, about human rights and women's rights uh, to create consequences about removing huge numbers of students from Canada, starting a trade, huge trade, I don't know if I should call it a war, the removal of, of their trade uh, that has happened between the two countries. It's absurd, so. Maybe while, he saw that Trump was beating up on Canada, he just wanted to get on board. I, you know, that's actually, I haven't thought about that, but maybe there's something to it. Uh, but at any hand, it's troubling, because on yeah. the one hand, you want to root for reform, uh, you want to really, and so many of the women in Saudi Arabia are incredibly talented, incredibly smart. The, the brilliant fathers who own the businesses have been passing them to their daughters and despite inheritance laws, working things out so that they, they are the ones running the businesses. Uh, there's so much potential there. 
but I worry so much about these reactions that what do they say? Do they say that, you know, they're not going to get there? Uh, what does it say? I don't know. I think on the one hand, we want him to succeed uh, in terms of reforms. I certainly do in terms of women's progress. On the other hand, I'm very worried about what's happened. There's clearly a push and pull. There has been international pressure. I guess bring this back to the U.S. for a second. Do you think with all of Donald Trump's problems, challenges in his relations with women, has that had a meaningful impact in America's ability to make a difference, help to lead, change the world for women getting included in other economies? Well, I think the problem is with America's leadership and what we convey in terms of our diplomatic work, in terms of our political leadership. Are we standing up for human rights anywhere in the world? Uh, maybe a statement here and there. But we have depleted uh, and undone so much of that commitment uh, that we have made over the years. We are only this great idea, the values that we espouse. You know, so many people in different parts of the world have said to me, I don't like criticizing your country. We really have always wanted to be like America, to be like you in terms of what you stand for, in terms of the freedom, in terms of the equality that we see in your society. And when you don't practice it yourselves, you let us down. Well, I ask you that precisely because on the one hand, America's ability to lead by example is clearly conflicted in that environment. On the other, the diplomats are still there and they're doing their jobs and America's still spending their money and there's more humanitarian aid from the US than anywhere else in the world and the private sector and the foundations and all the rest. So I'm just wondering, you as someone who does travel all over the world engaging in these issues, if you really want to kind of thread the needle on America as a force for change on these issues, you would say what? I would say America needs to do better. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, you're right, our diplomats are still in place, but we have just left the Human Rights Council. Now, the Human Rights Council certainly has had its problems. Nobody argues with that. But the reality... Which is largely an Israel-Palestine argument. that Israel-Palestine, yeah. you know, some other regionalism that's crept in, etc. But the reality is that's the place where so many human rights defenders come. Uh, that's the place that has issues before it today about some of the biggest violations in human rights. That's the place when it creates the evidence base that oftentimes that becomes the evidence that, that pro brings the prosecutions uh, for uh, crimes against humanity or, or war crimes. It's a, it's a forum that we should lead in. When you remove yourself, you can't be the voice uh, for change or upholding the voice for values. Uh, so, yes, we have people in place, but, but are our diplomats struggling as they might upholding uh, what they know to be the right thing? You know, some have resigned because they can't represent a government anymore that, that is contrary uh, or their view that it is so contrary to everything that we have espoused or much of what we have espoused. So it's, uh, it's not a pretty picture. Milan Verveer, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. It's a pleasure. And now on to a special game show edition of Puppet Regime. It's just like Jeopardy, but with more felt. Hi, folks. Ian here with a new game show to help world leaders recognize one another. It's called Who the Hell is That World Leader? Who the hell is that world leader? Exactly. First up, this world leader controls more than a billion people and has thousands of censorship officials who monitor and determine what those people see, hear, and read every minute of the day. Lawmakers in both Europe and the United States are increasingly worried about his global power. Who the hell is this world leader? I've been very tough. Very strong on China and on that leader right there, Xi Jinping. Well, that may be, Mr. Trump, but this world leader is... Mark Zuckerberg! <sighs> ah! Okay, Mark, now you're up. Yeah! This European world leader 
is facing unprecedented turmoil within her own governing coalition, and she recently almost lost her job over the question of what her country's relationship with Europe should be. Who the hell is this world leader? I'd like to apologize again for enabling Brexit. So I know that this is UK Prime Minister Theresa May. Your apologies are worth their weight in data, Mark. But no, this is German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Okay, Angela, now you're up. Last one, this should be pretty easy. This world leader thinks NATO is outdated. The European Union is designed to weaken his country and that the United States has no moral authority in the world anymore. Who the hell is this world leader? Mm, yeah, that is very hard to say, but I'm afraid that this is a... That's our show this week. We'll be right back here next week, same place, same time, unless you're watching on social media, in which case it's wherever you happen to be. Don't miss it. In the meantime, if you like what you've seen, check us out at g0media.com. Dot com.